if, uh, if anybody sees the lapel mic, let me know. It's floating around here somewhere. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. We've got a really long sick list and uh, try, to, try to get over all of these. And uh, please update me on any that, that you're aware of. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Shay Williams this morning had a, uh, well, she went this morning for a biopsy and, and a procedure on her lungs. And uh, uh, Trey texted me, I don't remember, it was sometime this afternoon. They didn't take her until well after lunch. Uh, but uh, the procedure went well. And uh, they appreciate everybody's prayers and obviously continue to pray for them uh, as, as they uh, try to determine what to do next with her and, and her situation. Uh, Rocky Ridings is still in a lot of pain. And uh, Sandra said that the oncologist recommends continuing on with the immunotherapy infusion every three weeks. And uh, uh, specifically, they've asked that we continue to pray uh, that his treatments will work and uh, will eliminate the cancer. So uh, we need to continue to remember Rocky. Um, Ann Hollis broke out of the hospital today and looks like she's fine. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. I didn't help her break out. She said, I appreciate all your help. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> No, we're thankful uh, Ann's back with us, and uh, we want to pray that medicine continues to, to work for her and, and, uh, and keep her heart in rhythm. Um, all right, Mac David Franks and Vicki are, are both uh, at home. Mac David, uh, well, Doug, you got to visit with them today, and uh, Vicki's having to wear a, a back brace. She opted to not do surgery. Uh, I think she said she'll be wearing it for, did they say three months? Is that what you understood? Yeah, That's, yeah. it was a, a whole, whole lot on, on both of them. So uh, definitely need to keep them in mind. Um, Dale Davis is, is not doing well, uh, and uh, we need to certainly remember her in our prayers, uh, her health is, is rapidly declining. Um, Deborah Taylor's brother, Jeff Hardy, uh, had surgery today, and I forgot to, to text Deborah. Has anyone heard from them? An update? All right, well, we'll continue to remember them in, in prayer. Uh, please continue to remember Corinne Bobo, that's Sharon Sullivan's mother, whose, whose health is bad. Um, Elaine Cashin is still recovering from her broken hip. She's in room 224 in the, the hospital here. Uh, she's in great spirits, doing really well, and, and looking forward to getting home. And uh, she's, she's pretty remarkable. She said, you know, this is my first broken bone, and uh, I think 95 years is a pretty good track record for no breaks. Uh, so she's, she's done really, really well. Uh, Terry Kerr is... Um, Still weak, um, continuing to, to try and improve. And uh, anyway, he, he still needs our prayers, um, is, is making a little bit of progress. Uh, Linda Quinn is, is still having some problems with her throat, and I believe she goes to the doctor tomorrow to try to, to determine what, what can be done to help her with her issues. Um, Ross Feltman is, is uh, still in the local hospital. Uh, not doing well, and uh, if, uh, you know, Joey Frederick is staying nights with him, um, so Ross will not be alone, and if you're able uh, or have, have time during the day to sit with him, uh, you, can, you can call Linda Kay Cashin, and she's sort of trying to set up a schedule of individuals to stay with Ross, um, and, and really to help Joey. Uh, Joey's... Uh, pretty tired and, and worn down. So um, if you can help in, in that way at all, uh, please, please see, uh, call Linda Kay or you can talk to me. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, Rita Gilmore is uh, undergoing some tests. She has pancreatitis and, and some other issues and uh, is, is pretty sick right now. So please remember her in your prayers. 
Uh, Art Seeley had hip surgery today, and uh, we believe Cavaline is next. Uh, <laughs> and it did go well. Okay, good. Well, that we're we're pleased to report that. Uh, Cavaline, I think, has some back trouble that needs to heal up first, and then she's going to have hers done as well. Um, and then Patsy told us this morning that her brother, Chris, uh, started his cancer treatments. Things are going well, but to continue to remember him in prayer. Uh, as far as the sick, are there any that we need to mention? Anybody else? Yeah. What's his first name? Datus. Datus Howell, okay, it passed away. Remember at Barn Creek, well, I hate to hear that. All right. Um, we mentioned this Sunday, uh, Glory Willingham's stepmother, we'd been praying for, for, uh, for Miss Eloise Allman. Uh, she passed away last week and, and was buried, and we do express our sympathy to, to her in that loss uh, also, as well. Um, we rejoice. Uh, last Sunday uh, morning, Day Stidham uh, decided to, to be baptized uh, Sunday, February the 18th, uh, made the determination that he didn't do it for the right reasons and, and wanted to, to, to make that right. And so we we're proud of Dace. Uh, he continues to struggle with his health as well, so please keep him in your prayers for that. This Sunday, uh, February the 25th, there will be a bridal tea honoring Jordan Watson, the bride elect of Josh Hollingsworth, at uh, the home of Donna Fowler from 1.30 to 3 p.m. And uh, don't forget also the Ladies' Day is Saturday, March 16th, so that's coming up very quickly. J.J. Davenport will be the speaker, and uh, there is a sign up sheet on the bulletin board if you'd like to sign up to help with any of those things. Anything else? We need to mention <clears throat> by way of announcements. All right, let's uh, bow for a word of prayer and we'll, we'll get started with our study. Father, we pray for all those that are uh, mentioned here that are on our hearts and, and uh, that we're thinking about. We're especially mindful of those who have lost loved ones and we, we pray for Miss Gloria. We pray for the family of Datus Howell. And, and pray that you will comfort them and, and bless them during this time. Uh, we, we pray for uh, Dale and Ross and, and their situations, and we pray that you'll bless them. Uh, we, we pray for those who are taking treatments and recovering from surgeries and, and uh, just having continuing health issues, and we pray blessings on them. Uh, we thank you for Dace and, and his commitment and love for you. And uh, we pray you'll bless him. Bless our study tonight. Forgive us for our sins. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So uh, we're, we're uh, about to finish up. Oh, I got one more note here. Um, all right. It says, we have five youth group students who are in need of financial help for the CYC trip. Um, Will says, uh, it, these... Uh, okay, I always tell our kids to never worry about money when it comes to trips like these if they truly cannot afford it. Um, there are five that fall into this category. If you could help them out by donating to assist with food costs on the trip, it would be greatly appreciated. Any donations can be turned in to your teacher. I guess that's me. Um, so <laughs> uh, if you can help out with that, please see me after class and I'd be glad to help in that situation. All right. Uh, so we were finishing up last week, almost finished, Ch Luke chapter 14. We got to question number 20, uh, and then we'll have some general questions and then try to get into to chapter 15. Um, but if you'll remember, uh, let me get turned to Luke myself. I had the wrong, wrong chapter. Okay, the, the, uh, the end here of, of chapter 14, verses 28 through 33 um, what illustration does Jesus give about building here in these, in these verses? All right, you've got to have some kind of a plan. Um, 
you know, you, you, you go out, we've talked about this before, but you, you see this sometimes where an individual maybe pours a foundation, maybe even gets somewhat of a structure up with some, some uh, you know, walls and trusses, and then that's it. That's all the farther they went. And you say, well, what happened? We ran out of money. <laughs> and you think, well, man, you just wasted all that money. That concrete was expensive, and the steel that went up, that's expensive. And, you know, what, what, what happened? Well, we ran out of money. So Jesus says you've got you've to you've have a plan. So is that really, though, what he's saying? Obviously, that's, a, that's all right, count the cost. Figure out, if it's, figure out if it's worth it. Figure out if you can do it. That, how does that specifically re, uh, apply to Christianity, of counting the cost? Yeah, it's not just about getting dunked and saved. <laughs> you know, to put it kind of uh, bluntly, there, it's a lifestyle. It's a, it's a choice that, that we're going to make from here on out that we're, we're surrendering ourselves to the Lord. Um, and in fact, that's sort of what Dace said is he just didn't feel like he, he understood that commitment. And that's, that's difficult, you know, when we're younger and uh, we, we make those decisions. Uh, I was really young when I was baptized and, and, and at times sort of questioned that, that same motivation. Was, was my motivation solely that I didn't want to go to hell or was it, did I understand, you know, uh, what, what I was doing? And uh, I, I think even in certain situations where the primary motivating factor may have been a fear of hell, there was still an innate sense of obedience, right? I, I want to do what God wants me to do. And I think that's part of the commitment. And, and so, I don't know. Sometimes I think we, 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 we trace that down and we, we think it through and we overthink it. Um, because, and I understand, I'm not, I'm not criticizing Dace's decision. I was, I was rebaptized in college. I, I did the same thing. But I remember a few, a few weeks after I did it in college, something else happened, and I thought, well, I didn't really realize that. Maybe I need to do it again, and I thought, wait a second. <laughs> All right, we're going down a pathway here that's never going to stop, and uh, I'm just going to keep the baptistry doors wide open. Uh, we're never going to know everything, are we? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, a continual, it, it, it's a continual thing. I, we had a debate in a class I was in uh, several years back, and, and a young lady said, well, um, and the question was asked, what do you have to know to become a Christian? And, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of debate there, and, and I don't know that there's, there's not a book, chapter, verse where we could say, well, here's exactly what you have to know. Um, her, her, her thing was, well, you, you have to fully she argued with me and she said, well, you have to fully understand the organization of the church. Elders, deacons, all that. And I said, I, <laughs> I, that, I think that comes with uh, teaching them to observe all things. You know, now, is it important to know? Well, yeah, I, I believe it's, it's very, very important. And we need to, we need to structure our congregations in the, in the biblical way. But I don't know that that is... I don't know. You, I don't know that that's the, the deciding factor. I think when you recognize you're, you have sin, you're responsible for your sin, and Jesus came, lived a perfect life, and died so that your sins could be forgiven, and you're going to submit to him for the rest of your life and commit that you're going you're to learn and, and grow, I think that's really what it boils down to. Joan? Yeah. Yeah, what did they know in Acts 2? Did, were, they, were they instructed on elders and deacons there? <laughs> right, I, I don't, yeah. And Joan said, and I, that's a great point. Joan said that they were pricked in their heart. Well, they weren't pricked in their heart about church organization. I can promise you that. <laughs> they weren't pricked in their heart about, uh, you know, any of those, those, and I'm not saying peripheral in a, in a negative way. I, I'm just saying peripheral in terms of the, the gospel saving message. 
They were pricked because they realized that they had killed the Son of God and they needed forgiveness. They needed to know what to do to get out of that situation. It was. Right. There's, I, I agree. Bob said their main motivation was fear. And, and this is a, I think that's a great place to look. Get, uh, Kelly? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think you're right. Th- everything's covered with confession is what he said. Um, you know, and in, in, in through the years, too, I, I've run into individuals who, who will say, I think I need to be baptized again. And I always, I always say, you know, listen, that, that's fine. And at the end of the day, if you, can't, if you can't sleep because of this, there's no reason for you to have a guilty conscience. I, I have no issues baptizing someone again. Uh, but let's, let's investigate a little bit more what was going on when you did it. And a lot of times what it is is, well, I did something really bad. And that's unnecessary, isn't it? If I'm, I'm talking post-baptism. They'll say, well, I did something really bad, so I need to be baptized. No. <laughs> that baptism, when you came in contact with blood, uh, the blood of Christ, it continually cleanses. Um, you know, some people can't get over it and, 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 and feel like uh, for whatever reason they've, they've got to do this. But anyway, um, Jesus' illustration here, he's saying, make sure if you're going to be my disciple, you really are going to be on board with being my disciple. Like, it's going to be some tough times coming. And it's interesting to think about that some of these individuals that he's talking to, certainly the apostles, and others like them, they're going to literally lose their lives for the sake of the gospel. And so he's saying, are you sure you want to go that far? Count the cost, figure it out, uh, because the time's going to come when you have to make that decision. And uh, so pretty, you know, pretty, pretty strong language, um, a pretty, pretty important passage. And it's good for us, for sure, to teach our young people this passage and to help them to understand the commitment. Um, but again, I, I think you guys are right. Um, fear is not a bad, a bad thing. Fear, fear of punishment is not a, a bad thing. It's, it's a motivating factor. Um, and I understand the other side of it too, where it doesn't need to be the only factor, but it, it certainly is, it's, it's what motivated them uh, to, to do what was right in Acts 2. All right, 21, this last question of chapter 14, what does Jesus teach about salt? Verses 34 and 35. Yeah, no good. If it doesn't have flavor, what good? I mean, why put it in your food if it's not going to help? I was going to say, that's exactly, every time I read that passage growing up, Tommy said, put it on the roads. That's what I always thought of. <laughs> well, we could use it on the roads or the sidewalks. I used to have to salt the sidewalks at the church, and, well, that was annoying. Of course, if you use table salt, it would take, <laughs> that would take a long time. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, what else, what else is it good for? He, Jesus says, uh, verse 35, it's neither fit for land or for the dung hill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear let him hear. What's he, what is the point of the, obviously this is an illustration, what's his point here? I'll take your word for it. I, I didn't do well in science. <laughs> Kelly said if the, what is it, the NACL leaves, that it wouldn't be any good for the roads anyway. So it's got to be salty in order to melt the ice. Well, see, all these years I learned, I've learned something new, finally. <laughs> uh, the point, Jesus' point again is, if you're going to, if you're not going to 
follow through with your influence. If you're not going to follow through with, with what the Lord has, has, has given you, what good is your commitment? What good is any of it? You know, so you've, you've got to follow through with, with all these things. Um, salt in, uh, hmm, something to think about that just popped into my head is, is salt always given a positive value in Scripture? I think it, or at least an influential, I, I think it's always described as something that is like a positive influencing factor. And, and I guess what I'm getting at, you know, like yeast is used both ways. Yeast can be talked about the growth of the kingdom, but it can also be talked about the influence of evil. But I think salt's always positive. Greg? Verse 34. Yes. Uh, salt is good, <clears throat> mm-hmm. but it is lost taste after the salt be restored. It's good or bad. If I can yeah, right. There is good and bad there if... Obviously, if the salt has lost its its flavor, um, that's that's the only way that it's it's called negatively, I guess. But once again, he's saying if if you are being the salt that you should be, you know you're going to be fine. But otherwise, you've you you have no purpose. And uh, sometimes I don't know if you've ever heard this this phrase, and I think it's helpful to describe. Um, you know, apathetic Christians or whatever. Have you ever heard the phrase um, "practical atheism"? And it's it's the idea that sometimes we we say we believe in God, but we don't live like we believe in God. And practically, we might as well be atheists. That commitment level's not there. We're you know we live like the world. Uh, we we don't make sacrifices. We're not we're it's convenient, Christ, if, if Christianity is convenient, we'll do that, but other, it's the same, perp, I, I think it's the same principle here with the salt, what good are you? If you're not, if you're not really a Christian, if you're not really living your life out in, in faith, then <laughs> what good are you doing the cause of Christ? You're not, you're hurting it. Um, but I, anyway, that's, that's a phrase that floats around on occasion, I, I think it's helpful, because uh, first time I heard it, it was helpful for me to realize, well, whoa, am I, that's kind of scary, you know. I'm, I'm not an atheist, but do I live like one? So, Im- important to think about. Have I ever seen any salt that wasn't good? Um, not to my knowledge. Um, I, I don't know. I, what? Yeah. Salt is just a physical makeup. But some salt is good, some salt is bad. You know, it depends on what you say. Sea salt. Yeah. Salt water. Right. It's salt on fire. It's not being confident in God. That's all different than sea. It means all kinds of things. Yeah. Other things. Yeah, that's true. Yes. It's said fun and ugly. It just really doesn't have to. It doesn't do the food much good. Yeah. So two or three years old. Really? I'd. I really don't put salt on my food. I, I don't. I, I don't know what it, I don't like salty stuff. So I don't, I, I genuinely don't know. I, yeah. Yeah. Because she didn't get enough? Yeah. <laughs> I, that's probably what will happen to me. And it's like a curse to me. Yeah, and some people do have to, to eat salt given given that, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I've licked on a pretzel long enough where it didn't taste salty anymore, but I don't know if the salt's there or if it's been digested. <laughs> so I don't know. I, and that, I've, I've wondered the same thing, Ron. Like, how does it, I guess it does lose its saltiness at some point. I've never, I've never known of it to happen. I'm not questioning Jesus, but anyway. All right. I'm showing my... Science ignorance. All right, let's do some general. Yeah, that's true. It's just an example. <laughs> All right, so who was Pilate? All right, governor. At this stage in the story, of course, we know 
We know who he was in, uh, in the crucifixion, but we haven't gotten that far yet. Do you remember how he was described in the chapters we've studied so far? Yes, I, I think so. He's called the fox be, uh, because of the, uh, back here at the beginning, let's see, it's back at the beginning of, uh, I grabbed the wrong Bible. I'm using a different one. You know how it, I can see it in my other Bible. It's right here on the left-hand column. <laughs> it's not in this one. Um, well, it had to do with the insurrection uh, where, where the Galileans were killed and, and it had to do with, with Pilate. Um, well, anyway. He was a hard, cruel man. Oh, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it was Herod that was called the fox. Um, well, this was before. Yeah, because it's, it's back when the, uh, well, what was it? I thought it was at the beginning of a chapter. Yeah, chapter 13, uh, verse 2. The Galileans were worse sinners. Uh, oh, in the season, uh, some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. That's what, yeah, that's what it was. Whatever he had done, uh, and they still don't really know exactly, but, you know, there were these individuals that got slaughtered while they were at the altar offering their sacrifices. And so, you know, the, the big debate during the intertestamental period was, you know, with Judas Maccabeus was when they were mixing the, the, uh, the pig's blood with the animal sacri with the, the, the regular sacrifices, and it was, you know, it, it caused a, a battle, a fight, and, and the Jews went to war. And yet this situation was so bad that uh, Pilate comes in and the individual's bloods who were, blood who was being offered at the altar is mixed with the sacrifices that they're offering. Um, I think we're speaking in tongues back there. <laughs> anyway, uh, all right, so that, that, that's who Pilate is, at least at this point in the story. All right, number 23, what was the Tower of Siloam? <clears throat> Okay, well that, yeah, well that was the, that was the Tower of Babel. Um, it fell, as I think they've determined it was, it was there by the Pool of Siloam. Uh, you know, John 9, the blind man went and was healed there. And uh, Jesus uses that incident and the incident with Pilate and says, well, who was at fault here? You know, is God unjust that these individuals died? And his, purpose, his point is no. And, and they, the Jews, <clears throat> those who were present, I think they were wanting to know, well, how do you justify God's actions in this moment? And Jesus sort of gives a similar answer to that that we read about in the book of Job, and that is God is just. We need to trust that he's just. We don't understand what all is involved in his decision-making, and we just need to have faith that, that he's doing what's right because he, he will. Um, all right. What's the ruler of the synagogue, number 24? <clears throat> well, I, it, it may not have been any of them, actually. I, I think the ruler of the synagogue was almost a glorified janitor. Um, I think he pretty much organized, kept things clean, um, made sure that everything was orderly. He may have been in charge of some of the order of their services. They were very stringent. You know, the, the synagogue worship was very um, ritualed and, and, and ordered, and I believe he was in charge of that. Now, there may have been situations in synagogues where the priest or, high, you know, was, was maybe in charge, maybe was serving both capacities, but from what I can understand, it was, it was just an individual who was in charge of, of what all went on around the building. Um, 
And of course, he's, he's mentioned there uh, in, in Scripture. You, you find several mentions of the ruler of the synagogue. Uh, and again, much, much more important role than, um, than just, you know, sweeping the floors, uh, but, but probably not a religious designation so much. All right, 25, who were Abraham and Isaac? All right, God's prophets, father of the faithful. Uh, you, you got the beginning of the people of Israel. Been doing some reading here lately, and uh, some pretty interesting stuff pointed out that I hadn't thought about um, with the children of Israel specifically. And in, in, in terms of just the Middle East, the Eastern mindset and how they viewed family, and uh, I've always, you know, when you're younger, I always just thought, oh, well, God calls Abraham, they become the children of Israel, and there's just this group of Israelites, and they all, you know, they want to get out of Egypt. And, you know, then I kind of came to realize, well, when they were leaving Egypt, half of them probably didn't even recognize that they were Israelites. Some of them did, but a lot of them didn't even totally grasp it. I mean, they knew their background. But this book uh, I've been going through was talking about the fact that the, the lineage, of course, and the, the genealogy is incredibly important for, for, for people of that mindset because they want to know who they came from, and that matters a lot to them. Um, for us, it just, it, it may be, it's, it's a matter of interest, but it's not a matter of importance. For them, it really was. And uh, it was really interesting that for those individuals at that time, especially with, with the issue of, of the Israelites, they were probably more concerned with their local clan, like their local group of individuals, and not thinking so much about the big picture. And so when you get to these statements in the New Testament where... Uh, Paul and others write and say, now you are all sons of God, you are all people of God, uh, adopted by God. Essentially, they just almost couldn't fathom that everybody could be a part of this same family together. It just didn't make any sense at all. And, and, and basically, they were all being told that they were going to be firstborn. You know, we, we're, we're all going to be given the inheritance, the blessing. And that double portion that went to the firstborn, it wasn't that he was special, it's that he had the responsibility of taking care of the rest of the family. And uh, so we're getting that as Christians without the responsibility, in, in essence. It's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty interesting uh, read. Yeah, Kelly? Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's a good point. Kelly said he was listening to a program, and Rabbi predicted that there were at least twenty-five percent of the Israelites stayed in Egypt because they liked it. Uh, those that got out in the wilderness certainly acted like they did. Take us back to the meat pot. <laughs> it's one of my favorite, uh, you know, misalignments of what's going on. <laughs> Take us back to slavery is what they said. But uh, anyway, that's who Abraham and Isaac were. 26, who foretold that the Jews' house should be left desolate? <clears throat> you say, always go with Isaiah. <laughs> that, statistically, that's probably the best guess. Anybody come up with anything different? Jesus did, yeah. He said, "He said this. You know this. This is when he steps in, to, and he says, what a shame! You know, look, look at these people, look at this land, and, and the, the potential blessings, and yet all these things are going to happen. All these bad things are going to happen because you won't turn and repent. Remember, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish." He says in Luke thirteen three and six. All right, 27, the excuses offered included families, real estate, stock. What excuse is there uh, that, that God will accept? 
All right, none except repentance. Yeah, that, that's a good way to that's a good way to put it. None except I'm sorry. <laughs> that's it. You can't. Uh, well, obviously the uh, the obedience, but the point is. They all just said, well, we can't come to the banquet. We can't come be a part of you because we got all these other things going on. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, I, modern eyes, we look at that and we look at their excuses and just think, other than the marriage one, it's kind of like, eh, those aren't very good excuses. But I think that's one of those things maybe lost in translation from, from a cultural standpoint. They was probably pretty good excuses. And... Uh, Anyway, Jesus' point is, it doesn't matter. You can't make excuses. You have to come follow me. 28, what is the object of using salt to preserve meat or make sound meat of meat already spoiled? <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, it would preserve meat. Um, what, what, all, what all does Jesus say here? We pretty much just covered it, but. If the salt isn't any good, it's no use. So be faithful in your, in your, um, your commitment to the Lord. And then this last question uh, is, is kind of out there in, in terms of what we've been studying. But if a man is born depraved, is he already spoiled? What do you think? I'm seeing some no's. Uh, I always I always love when Ted talked about you know um, some and I've never heard it but some who uh, who claim that we're born in sin born sinners uh, and he's shared this before that the evidence for that is dirty diapers that that is evidence of sin <laughs> I've just always thought the only evidence of sin there is that it's probably caused some parents to sin <laughs> uh, when they had to deal with it but that. That is not evidence of sin. That's the natural function of life. I mean, the animals do it. So if you're going to make that argument, you've got to say that every animal is sinful as well. And that I, animals don't have consciences. Pardon? How would you define the word depraved? Okay, how would we define the word depraved? What do you, how would you define it? Apart from God, essentially, or... Yeah, always doing bad. Um, no, no positive sense of morality. Just evil, I, I guess. Away from God, that kind of thing. Um, what's that? No, I, I don't believe anyone's born depraved. I, I believe uh, we're born in... I believe we... The scriptures teach we are born into a sinful, fallen world, um, and we are inclined to sin, obviously. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but that does not mean we're accountable for those sins at, in, in any respect until we understand what we're doing. Um, anyway... I'm not really sure where that text or that question fell in with what we've been going over. Any, uh, <laughs> anyway, any other thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. Right. Right, yeah, if he's born, yeah, that, yeah. To answer the question, if he is born depraved, then yes, he is spoiled. I mean, and spoiled in the, not, not in the sense of, I'm going to spoil this little kid, like spoiled as in rotten, bad, evil. Uh, but I don't believe that's the case. Um, I, I guess so. <laughs> I, maybe that was the... <laughs> yeah. It said... Uh, Oh, make sound meat of meat already spoiled. Oh, I didn't catch that. I don't think that... No, I've never heard of that. That sounds like something on an infomercial. Like... <laughs> J.D. Tant, he's long gone. <laughs> he had a spoiled... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the, 
something spoiled with those questions, maybe. <laughs> All right, well, I don't know that we answered anything on those necessarily, but we'll pick up with chapter 15 next week. And uh, I guess the lesson to take from tonight is make sure you thoroughly cook all of your meats, uh, especially poultry, and uh, <laughs> we'll go to God in prayer <laughs> as we dismiss tonight. Father, thank you so much for letting us be together and, and study again from your word and uh, help us to, to understand how important it is that we commit ourselves to you and um, we count the cost and, and that we take very seriously our, our, our life uh, of dedication to you. We pray that you will bless us, bless our, our commitments to you, forgive us when we fail you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen.